Hello, everybody. My name is Robert Riley, and I'm an interventional cardiologist at the Christ Hospital in Cincinnati, Ohio. And I've been asked to give a talk about CTO-PCI in patients with prior bypass surgery. These are my disclosures. So doing CTO-PCI in patients with prior cabbage is relatively common. If you look at two large registries, both the Progress CTO and the Open CTO registry, you can see that about one in three patients who were doing these registries uh, were, had prior bypass surgery. As you continue to build a program and gain skill sets and start to really get a larger referral base, you'll also notice in some data that we published last year from our own registry that you will start to do an increasing number of patients who are post bypass in your program. And this really fits with the real world experience of high volume operators seen in progress and open CTO. Now, patients who are post-bypass are certainly more complex, both from an anatomic and physiologic perspective. You can see on the left-hand part of your screen, uh, in post-cabbage patients versus non-post-cabbage, those post-cabbage patients certainly have increased comorbidities, making their physiology a little bit more complex. And that's everything from increased rates of hypertension, dyslipidemia, prior MI, to chronic renal insufficiency, lower ejection fractions, et cetera. You will also see an increase in the anatomic complexity in the post-cabbage patients comparatively. You'll see increased calcium deposition. You'll see increased ambiguity. You'll see increased JCTO and progress CTO scores. And what this translates to as an increased need for complex uh, revascularization for these CTOs comparatively, including need for dissection reentry, need for retrograde. And then interestingly there at the bottom, you'll see an increase in balloon and crossbow, balloon and dilatable lesions, again, because of this increase in calcium deposition. And we're gonna talk a little bit more some of those unique challenges in post-cabbage uh, patients a little bit later in this talk. Now, uh, being post-bypass certainly does increase your risk for procedural failure. You'll see uh, in Jack CI a few years ago reported in a different registry, uh, creating this sort of uh, CL, clinical and lesion-related score. The top two predictors of procedural failure were severe calcium and prior cabbage, severe calcium also being present in post-cabbage patients. So certainly a marker uh, of tougher cases there, which goes along with the increased complexity of the anatomy. This is uh, also reproduced in the progress CTO registry, as you can see in the right hand of your screen, again, lower technical and procedural success rates in post-bypass patients. Now, overall, it does not appear that being post-bypass increases your overall risk of major adverse events. If you look on the left side of your screen, the progress CTO complication score being post-bypass was not a part of that, not one of the significant predictors of major adverse events. And then if you look in the open CTO registry we published a couple of years ago, again, prior bypass, not significantly associated with an increased risk of major adverse events compared to uh, not being post bypass. However, really interesting data from the progress CTO registry. If you look here on the right hand part of your screen, you'll see that prior cabbage patients have increased risk of death and acute myocardial infarction in the period procedural uh, period compared to non bypass patients. On the other side, you'll see there, uh, prior cabbage patients had more PERFs, but less often was it a big deal, meaning less risk of tamponade and pericardiocentesis, again, because major areas of that pericardium have been taken away by the post bypass. So sort of on that line, again, the, the overall risk is not increased, but there are certain parts that are increased comparatively when you're post bypass. And I think one of the big things to talk about is post, -cab uh, post cabbage perforations being a big deal or not, question whether that's fact or fiction. So when we look but just overall PCI perf rate over the last decades, relatively low in the NCDR. Uh, at least one out of five occurs in post-cabbage patients. So decent power there to actually do a comparison uh, in post-cabbage versus non-post-cabbage patients. And in post-cabbage patients, they certainly were less likely to have a major adverse event. But again, this is not 0%. So this is still a big deal and something we have to be uh, very cognizant of. And if you look at the open CTO database, again, perforations in post-cabbage patients were a big deal. Now, the reason that they're a little bit more challenging to deal with when there are major events in post-cabbage patients is that the location is often very different. Most of the pericardium is usually taken away in a bypass patient, but they do often leave that sort of anterolateral, infralateral area that's really tough to get to without lifting the heart up. And so that's why you'll get these kind of unique locations, as you can see here, of the effusions, which are often loculated, very difficult to get to. Uh, and this is, again, because of that partial, peri uh, partial pericardiotomy that can make it very difficult to both diagnose because the symptoms are a little bit different, and you'll get these really unique complications from that loculated pericardium. You can get everything from LA compression, circumflex, 
perf, which is what we really worry about because that's where that loculated pericardium is. You can get compression of the PA pulmonary vein, LAD, et cetera. And so one of the things that we often see is that it's more often to occur in cirques where you do get this tamponade. You've got to be really, really good about the echo and making sure that you look for that area on the echo, making sure you look for LA compression, making sure you don't get increased velocities across the mitral bar, getting a pseudo stenosis there from a loculated tamponade. Um, and then when we don't get these classic symptoms, because again, they're not in classic anatomic uh, places, we have to be really vigilant. And this is a really interesting study that showed that the median time from, from perforation to presentation was 46 minutes after being discharged from the cath lab in post-cabbage perforations that resulted in tamponade. And interestingly, most of these patients had normal echoes and hemodynamics in the lab. So we always say this really necessitates very vigilant monitoring for at least that first golden hour, first one to two hours uh, after the perforation. So here is an example of a post-cabbage perf in a CTO I was doing, you can see a left dominant system that we're going after and there's this degenerating vein graft up top I decided to uh, go through to try and get that before trying those septals as you can see there. You can see here setting up for a reverse cart, relatively routine there. You can see we've externalized the wire now and look at that little pinch right there in that bend. Circumflex, post cabbage, again, be uh, vigilant there. So I was having a hard time getting a microcatheter around anagrade there. So I was trying to balloon that open so that I could probably eventually have to rota. Unfortunately, even this small balloon, as you can see here in the middle, resulted in the perforation you can see over there on the left. In this case, because I had an externalized wire, I was able to actually get some other balloons, quickly modify, and then get a stent in. You can see the perforation is really just sitting right there with those two little bubbles. And you can see here, thankfully, we were able to treat this with just a drug-eluting stent and get a really good angiographic result. Always nice when you see that stain not going anywhere and just sitting there. So I think, you know, um, Mono's put out a really, really nice illustration of all of this very succinctly in Jack CI earlier this year. The patients in post-cabbage uh, CTOs are going to be more complex, both from a physiologic and an anatomic standpoint. It's going to um, also require increased, uh, increasingly complex crossing methods. There's going to be more contrast, longer fluoro times, and the outcomes are going to be a little bit different. There's going to be a higher incidence of mortality, uh, and perforation, although again, perforation risk is less so than in the non-post-cabbage patient, but again, not zero. And so we just have to keep this in mind when we treat these patients. Now, I, I thought this was a really neat little thing is that an additional um, CTO-PCI indication uh, actually occurs in patients who've had prior bypass. And so this is some really um, nice data that came out a couple of years ago in Jack that showed that uh, the patency of saphenous venous grafts uh, compared to CTO-PCI, there's a huge delta there. And we used to think this teaching was, oh, it's because we were treating saphenous vein grafts with bare metal stents. So once we look at the data with drug eluting stents, they'll be much better. Turns out it was actually paradoxically worse. And if you compare the target lesion or vascularization failure rate in treating vein grafts versus the native lesion, um, that we've really, really had a big push um, as uh, as a, as a group to really try and treat the native vessels comparatively, simply because it's the best interest in the patient because they have much, much better longevity rates there. So here are a couple of problems that we routinely come into with post-cabbage patients compared to non-post-cabbage patients during CTO-PCI. We certainly see increased coronary calcium deposition, and there's something about a pericardiotomy that leads to increased coronary calcification that can make it really, really tough to get through these lesions. There's also anatomic ambiguity, both from coronary calcium and from actual uh, change of the vessel course from sort of tenting or kinking from these bypass grafts, uh, exerting force and actually lifting a lot of these vessels up. This will lead to cap ambiguity and ambiguity about the vessel course as well. Then there's the bypass grafts themselves. So they are advantageous in the sense that they provide a really nice uh, retrograde conduit often, but they do create these anatomic ambiguities we spoke about. There's suture lines that can be tough to get across. There's the angle of the anastomosis that doesn't always allow us to go retrograde. And then we're much more likely to have LV dysfunction. So again, this is going to um, impact how we plan to do these uh, chronic total occlusion PCIs. Here are a couple of things that we often look at. So we have impenetrable caps that we have to deal with during CTO-PCI, and here's some of the ways that we can deal with those. Everything from base to Carlino, scratch and go laser. And then our wire cross gear won't go. So we get really excited, we're across lesion, but then nothing will go in terms of a microcatheter. And then we have our algorithm for how to deal with that. Small balloons, bam, lasers, external cap press, et cetera. 
and all of that is explained in an algorithm within the algorithms paper we put out a few years ago. So here's an example uh, of some difficulty there in a post-cabbage patient. So somebody who clearly had uh, guideline recommended reasons for having revascularization uh, prior cabbage, as you can see there in the 80s with the LEMAT LED and a free remit RCA, high risk induced ischemia, inferiorly mildly reduced EF. And here's the diagnostic cath at the referring institution before being sent to me. You can see an epicardial that goes off the CERC there, heavily diseased CERC over to that RPL. Uh, which backfills the PDA, but there's really nothing that goes to the PDA. You can see that again here in a contralateral shot. So this seems to be our only way in so far. Here's the native RCA. You can see some ambiguity there with a big acute marginal that comes off the proximal cap. You can see it's a relatively short CTO there. Here's an interesting shot of this free rema here. It doesn't seem to go anywhere, but it does seem to backfill the mid part of the vessel there. There's just no distal outflow probably an explanation for why this patient's got so much ischemia. And here's the subselector shot of the lemma, not really showing that there's much left to right collaterals there. So for me, I got really excited about this REMA because I thought, you know, if I can go backwards, I can really help solve the anatomic ambiguity of the CTO itself and then come down um, once I got a uh, reverse cart there uh, and get the rest of the distal vessel. Unfortunately, I got very lost, uh, which is not super surprising. The angle is really tough to get backwards in the REMA. Uh, and then it didn't really help me out in terms of solving the ambiguity. So then I moved on over to that circumflex lesion there. You can see there's a ton of disease, both in the left main and then in that circumflex there. And so I tried to actually get through that to get to that epicardial, but there was so much calcified disease in that circumflex that I really, you know, I could get wires down, I could get across the epicardial, but I just couldn't get much to move in terms of my microcatheter because there was so much friction. So I ended up imaging, seeing a ton of calcium, which is not surprising, and ended up having to roto uh, both branches of that OM1 and that ongoing circ down into, uh, so I could get to that ongoing AV groove. Ended up having to do bifurcation stenting, making sure that I had the parent be that circ that led into that AV groove so that I didn't have extra metal dragging on my microcatheter to get over. You can see we got a pretty good result there. So then finally, we're ready to actually do the CTO. You can see some distal tip injections here, a really nice little uh, omega jump rope there in the epicardial. Ended up taking a SUO03 and Corsair Pro XS microcatheter, as you can see here, getting across. Finally get across, switch out, um, um, ended up having to do, uh, got retrograde, but still a little bit ambiguous there. So I ended up doing a base power knuckle antegrade in order to solve that proximal cap ambiguity since I couldn't solve it retrograde. I ended up meeting up in the middle of that CTO segment, as you can see here, doing guideliner assisted reverse cart. Judo 6 made the connection there after knuckling up with a Mongo. Um, and then you can see here our finished results. So this was heavy calcium, anatomic ambiguity, again, in a post-cabbage patient here, that was a little bit of a challenge. So some other things here, again, this anatomic ambiguity, really a big deal in these post-cabbage patients. And again, some algorithms for how to deal with both proximal cap ambiguity and distal cap ambiguity. Again, these are gonna be some advanced CTO techniques like base, base power knuckle, um, cart, uh, facilitated ADR. And again, that's all explained in the algorithms within the algorithm. Um, document that we put out. This was somebody with a ton of anatomic ambiguity. This was an RCA that I thought on the venous filling, I could actually see that distal RCA. Unfortunately, this vein had started to fail on multiple different occasions and it was time to fix the native. Um, I actually thought looking at that, that I could figure out um, where everything was, but really the distal cap was at that bife. So um, I kind of got my integrated gear in place and then came retrograde uh, to try and solve that ambiguity. Unfortunately, I got so lost in that PDA, I just could not find my way anywhere. And then integrate, I really could not help myself at all either and continued uh, to get a little bit lost there. So I ended up having to continue to struggle, integrate there. You can see here, I just cannot even using the retrograde gear as a marker get into that PDA. So I could get myself into the PL um, using that retrograde system, knowing where that jump graft was. So actually coming integrate through that PL, getting through the skip graft and then getting back into the PDA. Ended up having to do reverse cart there. Um, so remember, I'm in different planes at the bifurcation. So I've got true into the PL and then sub intimal from the PDA back into the RCA. So I end up having to find where uh, the neocrine is because I've shifted that proximally now. We end up finding that doing a long crush and then getting uh, a pretty nice angiographic result here. As you can see here, it's just not the one that we're used to seeing uh, all the time. But again, post bypass, 
and that, you know, difficult ambiguity in our anatomy and difficult calcium there. So bypass grafts, again, advantages, nice, you know, retrograde conduit, but again, the ambiguity, um, the suture lines. This is a really cool paper in uh, JIC from a couple years ago, again, illustrating several really good points about bypass grafts. So you can go through old grafts and you can definitely go through occluded grafts. It's really tough when they're flush with the aorta, but anything that's got a lead in, um, you can definitely go through uh, with pretty good technical success. You can see uh, that they were very successful and able to utilize those. It's very quick to cross, typically using jacketed wires if they're occluded. Uh, you do have to worry about coiling them when there's flow, and that's a different talk and a different conversation, but again, something to keep in mind, and it's a great way to learn how to practice coiling. Here's some unique challenges, again, with those bypass graft suture lines. Here's some ways of dealing with those suture lines when you simply can't wire across, again, described in that manuscript. Uh, everything from bilateral carlinos, which we had to do in this case here because we simply couldn't penetrate uh, the suture line from either direction, um, to basing at suture lines. As you can see in this case example, I kept wiring above and below, uh, simply could not get across the suture line, ended up having to do base power knuckle to get under that suture line in the subinthymal space, and then having a balloon retrograde to do cart uh, and then uh, complete the case as you can see there. So in conclusion, coronary CTOs are very prevalent in post-bypass patients. And then compared to patients who haven't had prior bypass, CTO PCI in post-bypass patients has increased anatomic and physiologic complexity. They're much more technically challenging in terms of use of retrograde dissection reentry techniques, increased calcium ambiguity. There's unique complication management we talked about in terms of uh, perforations, and then there's unique problem solving that we kind of went through in terms of degenerable caps, wire pressure won't go, suture lines, etc. Thank you guys very much, and please feel free to email me with any questions, robert.riley at thechristhospital.com. Thank you.